Good morning, church family. Good morning. Please stand. It's always, always, always a great day to be in the house of the Lord. In Numbers chapter 6, verse 24, we read, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful day to come and worship, learn your word, fellowship, and we pray that you would change our lives within and you would write your word on the tablets of our mind, our heart, our thoughts, our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning and welcome to Calvary Chapel Solano. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in addition to our Sunday morning and Thursday evening services, we have various ministries and events throughout the week that we would love for you to be part of. Here are the upcoming events. This week at Calvary, today after morning service, the Holy Grounds Cafe will be open and there'll be a Harvest Festival planning meeting in the youth study room, Tuesday's home life groups, Wednesday's ladies Bible study, Thursday's morning prayer group, midweek service, and chosen youth group, and Saturday's the Swiss Swordsman Ride to Calistoga and Lower Lake. For times and locations, please see today's bulletin. Today's message is titled, Hunger for the Word, from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. Today's cafe special are sandwiches every third Sunday. You have the option of a four inch sandwich only or a combo that comes with the sandwich, chips and drink. Please come by the cafe for a time of fellowship and great food. Hope to see you there. On Thursday, October 31st at 6 p.m., we will be having our Harvest Festival and Chili Cook-Off. This is a potluck event of finger foods and appetizers. Please sign up for suggestive items at the Welcome and Information Center. Also, if you are interested in entering your chili recipe in the cook-off, please be sure to sign up to participate. This will be an evening of food, fun, and fellowship. There will be games, pumpkin decorating, candy lays, pictures, dessert walk, corn dogs, candy apples, snacks, candy, and much more. Hope to see you there! Children open their boxes. You can hear the laughter, the cheer. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. I want the children to know that Jesus Christ is alive and he'll come into each and every heart that invites him. The mission of Operation Christmas Child is to share the gospel with children around the world. Because we bring gifts to the children, the mothers and the fathers accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. This box gives us a chance to show them that there is a light, there is a truth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. So we need to keep packing those boxes and continue to pray for the children around the world as we begin to disciple them. God bless you. Thank you. Hey, church family, if you feel led, we have shoe boxes available at the Welcome and Information Center in the foyer. Collection day is Sunday, November 24th. At this time, we ask you to please silence your cell phones. Thank you. Good morning and welcome.
Oh
Amen. Heavenly Father, precious Lord Jesus, we do come before you just hungry for your word, hungry for your Holy Spirit. We're so grateful that uh, all of our pastors um, throughout the Calvary movement, Lord, are always uh, teaching the word, the whole word, nothing but the word, Father, to keep us fed. So we thank you for that. Just um, prepare us, Lord, for the battle that waits for us outside, that we be ready for you, ready for opportunities to witness to others, to minister to others, Father. Uh, we look forward to celebrating the harvest with you, Lord, so just bless that event. Uh, bless those who can't be here with us this morning and anoint the message we're about to receive on your behalf. And we just thank you again, Father, for all that you are, all that you do. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. Well, good morning, church family. You may be seated. We're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. So Ashanti is going to come up and give an announcement. But go ahead and be turning there while she gives this announcement. Good morning, church family. I'm not passing out any fun envelopes today, so. Um, just real quick, um, as you saw the announcement, Harvest Festival is coming up. Just want to remind you guys, it's a great opportunity for you guys to come out with family, friends, and it's a family event. It's not just for the children, so we do have a ch chili cook-off. We have a potluck. Um, we also have a cornhole contest, and that was really big. So if you are a fan of cornhole and you have a friend who's a fan of cornhole, or even if you don't even know how to play cornhole, but you just want to do it, there is going to be a tournament going on. Um, there are going to be sign-up sheets for the chili cook-off um, to enter your chili into the contest for um, the potluck as well as the cornhole tournament. So sign up, come on out for a great time of fun and fellowship, and I have more fun than a kid, so don't leave them unattended with me. They will leave with lots of candy, so. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting Right there, actually, we're going to start at the last verse of chapter 7. It says, When the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square. That was in front of the water gate. And there they told, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from the morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and, ears, uh, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. And beside him, at his right hand, six men. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. And at his left, seven men. And Ezra opened, and this is verse 5, opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen! Amen! While lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So another 13 men, plus Levites, helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book, in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet. Eat the hamburgers and the milkshakes. <laughs> And spend portions to those from whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink, to sit in portions and rejoice greatly, because they understood the words that were declared to them. Let's pray. Oh, great and awesome God, 
thank you so much for your beautiful, perfect word. Thank you so much that it has been given to us, that we might have this time to gather together, to worship, that your word might be opened and read. I pray, Lord, that we would have understanding, that we would be built up and edified in your word. I pray this morning that we would cast all our cares upon you because you care for us. I pray, Lord, that there is anybody here that does not have an ear to hear, that you would give them ears to hear, that they would be attentive to your word and excited to hear what it is. Give us a hunger for your word, that we might come to you hungry for more of you. We want less of us, Lord. We want more of you. Go before this sweet time, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. We've been in Nehemiah for a few months now, and it has just been wonderful going through and reading about what God did through Nehemiah. There are so many principles that we could have learned and hopefully learned through these last few chapters that we've been going through. In chapter number one, we saw that God did a stirring on Nehemiah's heart when he heard that Israel was still destroyed. The walls were destroyed. The gates were burned. And he has a, a heart to see God move. And he prays a passionate prayer, a beautiful prayer. In chapter two, God moves on the heart of the king of Persia and gives permission for Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem to go back and rebuild, and he gives them the resources. In chapter three, we see the work began and the walls are going up. We see the 10 gates that they were building. In chapter four, we see the opposition from the enemy. How the enemy wanted to stop what was being done because anytime there is spiritual growth, there's going to be spiritual opposition. Chapter five, sadly, the work stops. Why? Because of the selfishness of the nobles. They were charging great interest to the poor so that they had to sell their kids into debt slavery. In chapter six, we see the walls are complete and but there's still more opposition. The enemy, Sembalat, Tobiah, and Gershom, they send for Nehemiah and say, hey, come to the valley of, oh no. But Nehemiah knew that they meant to do him harm. And he said, oh no, to the valley of oh no. He had a great work to be done. Chapter seven, we see Nehemiah reestablish their genealogy, their citizenship, that they might have confidence that they belong and know who doesn't. For us as Christians, it is wonderful to know where our citizenship lies. It's in heaven with Christ and we can have confidence in Christ. Now we come to chapter eight, the walls are rebuilt. And how many days? 52 days. And even the enemies, their enemies marveled, knowing that this was done by the hand of their God. And here we come. And the word of God is now opened. There is a hunger for the word of God. And the people desire for the book, the law, to be read. Now, this took place in the seventh month, which is in the Jewish calendar, Tishri, which is mid-September to mid-October. Rosh Hashanah is the first day of Tishri. It's a very sacred month for the Jewish people. The Feast of Trumpets would celebrate, would announce the beginning of it, and that's what they had. It's wonderful to go to Israel and hear the, the trumpets going off, and there's so much celebration happening. And then we have 10 days after that, we have the Day of Atonement, where the, the children of Israel were to reflect on their sin, to mourn over their sin. 15 days after that, we have the Feast of Tabernacles. From the 15th day to the 21st day was the Feast of Tabernacles. And this was a remembrance of God's provision for the children of Israel through the wilderness, how God provided for them. And it was a time for celebrating. It was a time of feasting, to eat the fat food and sweet food and to celebrate God's goodness. It was not time for fasting or grieving. It was celebrating. 
do you guys know that the Feast of Tabernacles started this last Wednesday? And it goes to this next Wednesday? So this week, if you're on a diet, get off of it. Eat the sweet, eat the fat. It's time to celebrate the provision of God. Yeah. This is a, a, a very special, special month for the, the people. And it says that all the people gather together as one man, meaning that they are gathered together for one purpose and one purpose only. And that is to hear from God through the word of God. When I read this, I think of a, another group of people that gather together with one mind, for one purpose, of one accord. The disciples. They had just seen their Lord and Savior crucified. And then he rose from the dead. And then he, he spent time with them, teaching them. And then he ascends into heaven. But before he ascends, he says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Wait, there's going to be something special that happens. And they're waiting on the Lord to move. Look at, look at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They're waiting on the move of the Holy Spirit. They're moving, waiting on the Lord. Acts 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with one another in tongues as the Spirit had gave them utterance. I think it is amazing that we see here when the Spirit of God is moving amongst the people of God, it brings unity amongst us. There is unity here. We have come to worship and to hear the word of God. And I pray that we would all be of one accord, one purpose, one mind to hear God's words, to hear from God. That's what we want to hear. We want to hear from God. We want to fellowship amongst each other. And the world today speaks of unity and how we should all come together. And if we come together and we all do the same thing and accept each other, then there will be what? Peace. But the world will never have peace. They will never have true unity because true peace, true unity only comes by the spirit of God. Well, look where they gathered. They gathered by the water gate. The water gate is located on the east side of the city. And it is just by the Gihon Spring. And from the time of David to the time of Jesus, this is where they would get their water for bathing. And also in the Bible, water for bathing, it symbolizes what? The word of God. This is no coincidence. They just so happen to gather by the water gate. God is moving. And when God's spirit's moving, it is a, it's a powerful thing. Ephesians 5.26, look it. This is husbands to read the Bibles to their wives that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. As Christians, we need to be washed by the word of God. This is what Warren Wearsby says, this quote. When we apply the water of the word to our lives, then the spirit can work and bring the help we need. It is refreshing to the soul when you receive the word and allow the spirit to teach you, end of quote. We need to let the word of God wash us. There needs to be a hunger for the word of God because, man, we live in a gross world. We get the world's gunk on us and we need to be washed. Our minds need to be cleansed. Now, they told Ezra. This word told in the Hebrew is that they commanded 
The people are not just wanting to hear the word of God, but they are desperate. They are starving to hear the holy word of God. I hear all the time people say what they can't live without. Think about it. What can't you live without? Coffee. Oh, I can't live without coffee. Don't talk to me before my coffee. I can't be a nice person to you unless I have my, my coffee. Their phone. Oh, I need my phone. Man, I just feel naked without my phone. I'm so desperate for my phone. Oh, I'm lost. TV, entertainment, sports events. The list goes on. Ho-hos. I don't know. I'm desperate for my ho hos Sadly, most people are desperate for anything but the word of God. So many Christians think very little about the word of God all week, and then they come for just a short period of time on a Sunday morning, and they hear the word of God, but so often are not listening. Their mind is somewhere else. But not these people, not these people coming to gather together to hear the word of God. They want the word of God. And in the language here in the Hebrew, it's, they're so excited, they start to chant, Ezra, bring the book! Ezra, bring the book! Oh man, when have you gotten that excited about the Bible time? To hear the word of God. Now who is Ezra? Ezra is a scribe and a priest who 14 years before this event came from Babylon to reestablish the, the people of Jerusalem to the Lord by reinstituting the priestly sacrifices and to reestablish God to the people by teaching the law. Look at Ezra. It says here in Ezra 7, 6, this Ezra came up from Babylon and he was a skilled scribe. A scribe is a, a Jewish teacher. Who's a skilled teacher? In the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel gave, had given. The king granted him in all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. Now, as a scribe, Ezra was dedicated to the law of God. And as a priest, he was dedicated to the service of God. Look at Ezra. Ezra 7.10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinance in Israel. Ezra was a godly man who practiced what he taught. No wonder the people are so excited to hear a message from a man, Ezra, who has prepared his heart to teach the word of God. Verse 2, so Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. All the men and women who could hear with understanding. This is where, here at Coward Chapel, we get our, the need for children's ministry. It says men and women. Now, could there have been children there? Yes. But they taught them with understanding. Six times that word is going to be used through this chapter. Two distinct things that you're going to, to look. Understanding in all the people. Thirteen times all the people is used. This is an exciting time. All is excited. That's what's unique. You know, there's some people that go, oh, I like the word. I love the word. But this is all the people. This is very exciting. But here at Cabot Chapel, we want everybody to hear the word at their level. That they might understand. That's why we, we, we work hard to get children's ministry workers to be back there and to teach them at their level so they can understand and come home. And go, oh, mom, guess what I learned? I learned about Noah's Ark. And I learned about the animals and how God protected them. I learned about Joshua and the battle of Jericho and how God brought the walls down. It's like, oh, awesome. You know, we want, we want it to be exciting for them. And it's exciting when you can understand. <laughs> if I'm up here speaking in a different language, then you can understand. It'd be like, oh, look at that guy up there. <laughs> But to understand the words of God, it brings excitement. In verse 3, then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from the morning until midday, 
before the men and women and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood, which they had made for the purpose. The people, they're attentive to the word. And look at this. He opens up the, the word and it's in the morning. It's like 6 a.m. The people gather at dawn. Just as dawn is breaking, they're gathering together. And for six hours, they're there to hear the word of God. I mean, we've got some comfy seats here. But I know, I, see, I sit in these seats. And I can only last so long. Six hours in a comfy room with air conditioning, with comfy seats, it's still hard. But six hours, these people were out in the open air to hear the word, and they're so excited. This is a move of the Holy Spirit. So we see Ezra, that he was prepared, his heart was prepared, his mind was prepared to give this message. The ministry workers, they had organized everything. They had prepared the stage that Nehemiah was going, no, Ezra was gonna stand on to teach the word so that the people could hear clearly. And we see the spirit of God, that he had done a great work in the people of God, that they were ready to hear the word of God. And there's so many pastors who could prepare their heart all week long to give a message. Seek the Lord for a fresh move of the Holy Spirit in their life. These pastors, they pour over the text that they're gonna teach on whenever the week, on a midweek or a Sunday. They'll read a bunch of commentaries, listen to a bunch of different pastors, put together a well thought out outline, prepare an application that could resonate with the people's lives. But if the people's hearts are not ready to hear it, it will mean nothing, absolutely nothing. When an individual spends all weeks fixating on their flesh, feeding the flesh, then all they can do when they come to church is see the flesh. They won't have, receive the blessing of the teaching of the word of God it'll be totally missed. For if we focus on the flesh, then all we will be able to see and hear are the things of the flesh and not the spirit. Galatians 6, 8. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. You'll be more focused if you've spent all week watching your favorite soap opera on the flesh, scrolling through Instagram or Facebook, or if you're in the flesh, satisfying your flesh, you'll be, you, you won't be focused on singing to the Lord. You'll notice everything else in the room. Why did they hang that banner? Look at that flower up there. That's a bright flower. Why did they do that? He'd be more focused on the, pastor, the pastor's clothes, his hair, than the word of God. You know how many times, and I talk to different pastors, they'll say right when they get done teaching, someone will make a beeline to them and they're like, oh, what they're gonna say, were they blessed by the message? Did God move in their heart? We need to get you new clothes. What are you doing? You need to go shopping. I'll get you a gift card. I'll, you know, who's your barber? You do it yourself? I can tell. <laughs> Let's go do it, you know. They're just focused on, on the flesh and not hearing the word of God. And sadly, so many churches today, in order to fill seats, have focused more on the things of the flesh than the spirit. The apostle Paul warned his protege, Timothy, that this would be the case one day. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. 
there are so many pastors today that say, don't teach and preach the Bible anymore. It's, it's abuse. The people, it's abusive to them to say, live a godly life. They can't. The world's too dark. You need just to encourage them. Give a good pep talk. Just encourage them. It's okay. The word of God is what changes. The word of God is what transforms. America, oh, America has gone astray. There's a, a writer, and he wrote this book, Democracy of America, in 1835, Alexis D. Tocqueville. And he says this, I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. In her democratic congress, in her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and I heard her pulpits flame with righteousness, did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. End of quote. This is a, a non-Christian man observing, but what he observed was the word of God being taught. There was a hunger for the word of God. And that goodness was a righteousness that only God can give through the transforming work of the word of God. America has turned their life away from the word of God. They are no longer blessing the name of the Lord. There is no longer a hungering and thirsting for God. Deuteronomy 28. If you bless me, if you come to me and seek me, I will bless you. But if you turn away from me, then there will be punishments, God says. Other kingdoms will come in and rule you. They will control. Guys, we are sadly God is punishing right now. We need to pray that there will be a hunger for the word of God. And, and how, does that, how does that start? It starts in your life. When your kids, your grandkids, the people around you, see a hunger and a thirst for the word of God in your life, it will excite them. It will excite them. They will now want to hear the word of God. Have Bible time. Celebrate the goodness of the Lord. In verse 5, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up, and Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, amen. 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 While lifting up their hands and bowed their their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Ezra opens the scroll to where he's going to read. And the people, they respond out of this excitement and reverence by standing. They know they're not going to just hear any man's words, mere man's words, but they're going to hear the word of God. Paul said to this to the Thessalonians, how wonderful it is that they received the word. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as is, it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. Who believe? 
Ezra blesses the Lord and the people respond in agreement. When you fix your mind upon the Lord in prayer, it often leads to worship. What is worship? But it is surrender. For they lifted their hands in praise, in prayer. They bowed their head in worship. Worship is surrender. They surrender to God. They don't think that worship is just coming on church once a week, lifting your hands and singing the song. No, it's throughout the week surrendering to God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we go to prayer, listen to this, Philippians 4. This is a verse that many of you have memorized, heard, and it's so encouraging. But let it be known how. Let's not grow old of verses that we've heard many times. Let's be excited. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your request be, be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. As you pray as you make your supplications to the Lord and that peace of God comes upon you. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thanksgiving just erupts. So excited. Thank you because you are so th thankful to be in his presence and in his peace. Verse seven. Now we've got these men and these 13 men and Levites, what does it say? They helped the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. He read to them distinctly. I believe the law of God, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the books that Moses wrote. Now, he's reading to them for hours and hours, and there's a lot there, starting, if he did start in Genesis. But I do believe, maybe he's in Deuteronomy. I love Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. Moses is recapping. Okay, we're coming to the end of this 40 years that we've been in the wilderness. Let's recap what we've learned so we don't make the same mistakes again. And as he's recapping, he's going through. Can you imagine all the people? And why, it said that they grieved when they heard. Why they grieved? Because they messed up. They realized for so long when, when trouble comes your way and you go, oh, woe is me. Why is this happening to me? Oh. And then when you realize, oh, man, it was my fault. God is correcting me. I've, I've drifted. I've gone astray. I've gone away from God's holy word. He got to, he's got to bring me back. And the people, they grieve. But the Levites, Nehemiah, Ezra, they say, don't grieve, don't grieve. This is a holy day, a special day. Don't let your grief over your sin, over where you've gone, overshadow the grace of God. God's grace is so much greater. His love for you is so much greater. read distinctly, meaning that he read it in a way that they can understand in their language. And then what, from the book, the law, and he gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Simply read, simply explained, and simply applied. Oh man, when you have the, the word of God read to you and then explain to you where you understand and apply it to your life and you go, wow, okay. It brings excitement. It brings a move of the, the spirit of God. What is a pastor's to do? Read, explain, apply. Paul saying to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4, one and two, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing 
and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. God's the judge. Do not judge. I, and, I, and I don't want to call any other pastors because it says, don't judge another man's worker or servant. God is the judge. One day he's going to judge the pastors that I believe have gone off track, that gone after the way of Balaam for money and fame and success and comfort, power. God's going to be the judge. I need to focus on teaching the word of God. That's what God has called me to do. Give yourself to the teaching of the word of God. It is so important. Give yourself to the teaching. Nehemiah, awesome godly man. Could he have read the law to the people? Yes, he was educated. But he had not been giving himself all his mind and his, his strength right here to the word of God. But Ezra had. That's what Ezra was doing. He was preparing. Now, why is he not, Ezra not mentioned earlier? Well, he probably had to go back to Babylon. And now God just so happened to bring him back right when they need to hear the word of God taught to them. Dedicated to teach the word of God and to be ready. Be ready at all times. Convince. What is that word in the Greek ex to convince? It means to expose. What, do we, what needs to be exposed? The love of Jesus for you. Rebuke. What, what needs to be rebuked? What this word means? It means to express strong disapproval. What needs to be expressed strong disapproval? Sin that separates us from the love of God. Exhort. What does exhort mean? Ur, it means to urge and encourage. And what to urge and encourage? That you present your bodies to the Lord as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to him. And that you stay in the love of Christ. As a pastor, I'm to do this with all long suffering, no matter what. To the very end, there was a time that I didn't get to teach. And I was very unhappy. <laughs> and I was talking to a pastor, and how are you doing? And, oh, okay. And, he, and we, we got down to it, and he goes, you're a pastor. You need to be teaching. You're not going to be happy unless you're teaching. That's what God has called you to do. I was like, okay. And it's so true. I, I kind of get selfish when it comes to teaching. I do. I wish I was teaching next week. <laughs> I'm excited to hear from Pastor Joseph, but I am kind of selfish when it comes to teaching. I love teaching. <laughs> I'm thankful that the Lord has given me these small opportunities, Lord, to teach. And I just want to be faithful to him, to prepare my heart, to prepare my mind, to present the Lord. Teach the word. Teach and preach. It's, it's so important. Teach to the very end. Hear. I pray the Lord would encourage you guys not to abandon your Bible, not to lose the reverence for the word of God. This book is precious. David said, I... I rejoice in the word as finding hidden treasure. Sometimes I do. I daydream about winning a million dollars. What would I do with a million dollars? Oh, when I find out that I get a tax return. Oh, hey. Thank you, Lord. And the Lord convict me. 
convinced, he just said, do you get that excited? Do you get that excited about the word of God? Do you get that longing to read the word of God? Oh man, I just can't wait to get home to read my Bible. This is something that is lacking in America. So I want to encourage all of you guys, pray that the Lord would work on your heart if you do not have a hunger for the word of God. Pray that the Lord would give you that hunger. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you so much that this book is with us today. Lord, it is such a blessing that we have the Bible at any time, that we could go and read your words at any time. But Lord, sadly, the Bible for so many has just just been there. It's, it's just been there the whole life and there, it's, it's not exciting anymore. I pray that you would bring back that excitement to your word. True revival is when people are excited to hear from God, to read the word of God. I pray, Lord, that you would just excite our hearts, that you would go before our week. Bless it, Lord. I pray that you go before us in Jesus' name. Amen.
trust in your word I rest in your word I place my trust for I know I must wait yes I know This is from my wife. I don't want you guys thinking I came up with this or said this. Yesterday we were on a bike ride, we went to the park and we were talking and, and she said, it is so easy to be deceived by buying into a, a lie. When you have not been in the word or gathering together with other believers, when you're not giving yourself truth. And I just want to back that up with scripture, John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17 is Jesus's prayer to his heavenly father. In the, in the Psalms, it says that God exalts his word above his name. If you have not been in the word of God, if you have not been seeking the Lord, focused then you will wander aimlessly buying into every fable. You need the word of God, truth, that will guard your hearts and minds. I pray that the Lord would bless you as you seek him this week. I pray that he would keep you safe, putting his angels around you, protecting you, going before you, behind you, around you. Seek the Lord. Be excited to see what the Lord does, how he uses your life in a big way. The Lord doesn't want to waste your life. Amen? Amen. Let's worship.
Have a blessed week. Have a blessed